I guess I'll start. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to be quite cruel first. I'm just going to make sure everyone's woken up a little bit. Um, hands up anyone who would describe themselves as a thema, a Drupal thema. If you include theming, then you can put your hand up, Ollie. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, who would describe themselves as a Drupal developer? Site builder? Okay, that's fine. And we should have something for everybody. And, and if you didn't put your hand up at all, then I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow. Okay. Um, Drupal Content Swiss Army Knife is my title, um, and it's going to be slightly rambly, but hopefully some sort of message will come out of it. Um, it's part case study and a part explanation of sort of experiences and discoveries I've had um, of, for more, more than a year of using Drupal as an agile tool to fix legacy publishing, publishing workflows, process content, um, and deliver stroke received content from a variety of sources. Um, my name's Chris Hall. Um, and my, it's a little bit small there. My Twitter is um, at cwork from Chris. Um, and these slides are actually on uh, GitHub, um, and I will be fixing any typos and anything that I see, etc. I don't know if the slides are going to be, um, I don't know if they're, 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 they're going to be published somewhere, presumably, or, but yeah, yeah, hopefully they will be. Drupal Camp uh, Brighton will hopefully publish some. Um, it's brought to you by me, as I said, I'm a freelance contract Drupal and PHP developer. Um, I, an honourable mention to a guy called Tim Corkerton, who was working with me for quite a lot at the end of this, um, and briefly was going to come and co-present with me, but he chickened out. Um, and thanks to a company called Atom Content Marketing, um, they, I've been contracting with them for about a year and a half, um, and they let me share a little information and, and to work with their clients over that time. Um, it's also part of an ongoing struggle to realise agility where it was really needed. Um, it's brought to you by a couple more things as well. Um, most of those are lies apart from the whiskey. Um, so just to put it back into context, I've spent the last couple of years working with this Atom Content Marketing and their clients, which has made things a bit more interesting, and Tim's worked with me for part of that time as well. Uh, and this is a kind of outline. I'm going to start with just a backstory, which explains the type of, type of environment that I found myself in. I'm then going to briefly explore what Drupal is actually good for. Um, briefly explore what you can do prior to writing any PHP whatsoever. And then I'm going to start hitting um, sort of the more developing stuff, um, Drush um, and the command line. And then there's a long sort of smeary bit, which is going to be just discussing some modules, libraries, um, mini use cases and case studies and that type of stuff. And then at the end, there'll be a kind of sum up and questions. Um, so really, this talk is more about this um, than what too fast than this. Uh, and a couple of disclaimers. Any code examples are just for illustration. Um, they're not guaranteed to run or be best practice. And unfortunately, most of the screenshots I've had to kind of sanitize or anonymize, so they're not particularly useful. I'd love to show you some of the full applications, but I'm under sort of NDAs, and they're from clients with clients, etc., etc. But hopefully, it will kind of make sense. Oops. Um, so, backstory really. Um, I started contracting for a company that concentrated on content. So they're a car, uh, content marketing company, basically. Um, they do kind of provide websites for clients, but in the past they've used agencies. Um, it's a, quite a small company, um, and at the time it was fairly under-resourced. Um, and the content came from all sorts of different um, sort of levels and, of quality and um, different backgrounds. Um, ranging from content that had been entered into WYSIWYG on um, old Drupal sites to highly structured XML content that was used somewhere else for publishing PDFs, etc. Um, and they had many content workflows. Um, most of those were based on Word docs, emails, and spreadsheets. Um, I'm not going to read all of that, but suffice it to say that I, Drupal, over the past three or four years, hasn't always turned out well for me. Um, 
I don't know if, what other people's experience are. Most of the time I've gone on really well with it, and I've been using Drupal almost exclusively, so it can't be that bad. Um, but there are times when it just doesn't do what I need it to do. And I'm suddenly in a new and challenging environment. I've got shifting priorities, um, requirements, very tight timescales and budgets, legacy and new sites, um, content sources, as I said, ranging from just stuff that's been pasted from Word documents into WYSIWYG up to highly structured XML, and a small development team. Most of the time that's me, apart from when I could hire uh, other people. <coughs> Um, and the first question, surprisingly, when I found myself in that situation was should I even be using Drupal? Um, one of the first things I had to do was pick up a legacy expression engine site and finish that for them. Um, they also had WordPress sites. Um, so really I was asking my question, myself the question, you know, is Drupal really the best thing? Because they've got this, this range of sites, um, which is obviously not a good idea for them. But um, you know, in theory, I it could have picked up with any of the other um, CMSs and solved some of their problems that way. So let's have a quick look at Drupal. What is it good for? Um, now, I'd say not everything. Um, I presume I can say that here. Um, and the first quote is from me, though most people seem to agree with it. Um, I find that with Drupal, typically the first 90% of a project takes about a week, and the remaining 10% takes anything from a week to three months. I don't know if that, does that resonate with anybody? <laughs> Isn't that the same with every technology? Yeah. No, no. <laughs> Worse or better? Uh, I, I, well, it depends. We'll probably, we'll probably, it'll probably become clear why, um, why I'm finding that. Um, but I'm not the only person um, that's coming to similar conclusions, obviously. Um, the next quote is from Wonderkraut, um, and they say with Drupal, features are cheap and details are expensive. And in fact, one of the first of many link outs I've got on here, um, they've got a, a, a brilliant uh, sort of blog post that explains what they mean by that. So Wonderkraut are explaining where they think Drupal fails um, for them and where it's uh, really highly successful. Um, so that's a link out to their blog post. Um, and just looking back, um, if we look to, Drupal for, look to the um, imminent release of Drupal 8, um, and the key difference I think most people are feeling is that it should make it easier to find Drupal talent, um, because currently Drupal has a you know, sort of long learning curve. So, I mean, just, just a simple example, we should, you know, Symfony developers should be able to step into Drupal pretty quickly. Um, and personally, I think an agile tool shouldn't require extensive learning curve before it becomes useful. Um, other ex improvements expected from Drupal 8, um, some of the biggest current weaknesses, perhaps controversial, um, uh, of Drupal, I would say um, it's not a brilliant ad experience for admins and site builders. Um, so other CMSs certainly do a, a better job of that. Um, um, Drupal 8 currently isn't very useful out of the box, sorry, Drupal 7 currently isn't very useful out of the box. Drupal 8 is going to improve that radically. Um, there's going to be a much better separation of configuration from code and data um, and improved templating. Um, I wasn't so sure about that because I haven't tried doing anything in Drupal 8 yet. Um, but based on some of the talks I've heard today, I think it's definitely going to be a much, much, much better experience. Um, the main strength remains, um, and that's content really. Um, now often Drupal's now being described as a content management framework rather than a content management system. Um, and I have to agree with this um, blog on Palantir. I don't even know how to pronounce it. Um, there's a blog post there that I've linked out to called uh, Drupal is not a CMS, um, where they, they kind of expand on that theme. So really what they're saying there, it's a system for building a CMS. Um, everything starts making a lot more sense uh, when you look at it that way. I don't think I need those, no. Right. Very importantly, let's have a look at what we can do before we write any PHP. This is just going to be an overview, really, just so we're all sort of um, seeking from the same hang sheet. Um, I mean, we can very quickly start to build our own content management system. And I 
based on my previous experiences in the past, I've done uh, Java, I've done Cold Fusion, I've done Perl, um, I've worked a little bit with Django, I've done, worked on the Expression Engine WordPress. Based on that, the interface in Drupal for actually building content types um, or the equivalent uh, is probably <coughs> the best I've ever seen. Um, this is you know, right out the box, this is your blank slate. You, uh, this is from Drupal 8, you've got a few more field types. Yeah, you can start messing around with building content types from those sort of things. And even those fields are highly configurable in themselves. You can stick in default values, help text. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with that type of stuff. Um, content workflow, um, and some of these things are quite di difficult in some of the other systems. Without lifting a finger, we've got user management, we've got roles, we've got permissions. Um, you can add diff and workbench modules, and you're building an extremely powerful content workflow um, without having to do anything really except install some modules and do some um, configuration. Actually, that hasn't scaled very well. But um, and that, that's just comparing revisions. Um, and you know, so now I know who did what and when. Um, I know, for example, <coughs> with, uh, well, when I was working with someone who's using Mod X, adding revisioning to things was a big deal. Um, but perhaps it isn't now, or perhaps there's a way of getting around that. But um, um, unfortunately, these aren't scaling perfectly. I had to use someone else's laptop. Um, but again, that adding that diff module, um, I can go straight in and just see what changes have been made on something. Um, that's all very powerful stuff, um, just from doing a little bit of work. Um, content classification. Um, I don't know what other people's experiences are. I've found sometimes working with other systems, there's usually some way of adding categories or you know, so, some sort of idea of a taxonomy, but I've never come up with anything quite as flexible as what you get out of the box with Drupal. You can add multiple taxonomies extremely easily. Um, and I again apologize for the scaling. If you um, install a module such as Taxonomy Manager, for example, that all becomes even better. Um, has anyone used Taxonomy Manager? Yeah, okay. So you've got, you've got an idea of what I'm talking about. Um, content search and discovery. Um, so once we build a large volume of content, um, I'll be mentioning views a little bit again later, but I guess most people are, are familiar with views, uh, which is just an amazing way to filter and sort things. Um, and Drupal search out the box um, <coughs> might not seem that good, but it's, it's better than some other ones that I've played with um, on other systems. Um, and you can straight away start adding things like the search API module and facet API module and something that I, I, maybe most people are familiar with it now, but at least a while ago, a lot of people didn't realize that, um, yeah, again, apologies, scaling, dull. Um, so I've got search facets coming up here on the right hand side. I don't have to do anything to get really difficult to get that to work. Um, and you don't actually need Apache Solar to start building a powerful search. Most of the search API modules and stuff that you can add work against the database. They might be a little bit slower, um, but if you're on a site where performance isn't, uh, isn't a big issue, then you can get all your facet API stuff working without having to worry about installing a separate Solar instance which is nice, and that's just some notes to expound on that. So I'm just gonna to pause to reflect a little bit on what we've looked at. So we can <coughs> build a pretty good system already without doing anything in PHP. Um, and Drupal 8, assuming a handful of contrib modules, um, obviously there's a lot of things in there already. It's got views in, <coughs> a lot of the fields, all the stuff. So it won't need a lot of contrib modules to be ready to actually be extremely useful. It's got other things like inline editing, which make it even nicer. Um, and um, building a content management system is relatively fast. Um, the slow bits I find building a Drupal site are trying to match the design PSDs and build the front end. Uh, we can do better though. So it's another link out. Um, I don't know if it's embarrassing, I can't remember how to pronounce her name. Is it Jenny? Jenny. 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 Yes, that's the second. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that. 
So Han, is it? I'm yeah. not sure. Yeah, yeah. I was in a talk just, yeah. just recently. Um, she has an excellent talk, which she mentioned in her talk, about building a tasty back end, and it's well worth, um, that's a link to one version of that. Um, really, there's no excuse for just leaving the default Drupal admin. You can make things so much better for your users um, by following the kind of comments that she puts in there, and it just makes a massive whole world of difference. It will get people on, on site extremely quickly. Um, but so I'm just going to hit you with a with a slightly odd word, a use case. Now this might, might seem <laughs> slightly strange, but bear with me. Um, so this use case is replacing a spreadsheet with Drupal. Um, I'm giving you an example here that's just happened to me recently, but I've done similar things in the past. Um, as you'll find out later, I'm getting to the point now where Drupal sites, um, I'm popping them up and using them, sometimes destroying them and doing other bits and pieces of them, um, sort of like at sort of fairly fast speed. Um, so everyone's encountered the case where content that's supposed to go in a website has been collated, gathered, edited in Excel spreadsheets. Um, you know, it's the, it's the kiss of death, isn't it? Prior to a website being developed. Um, um, so the particular example um, is one agency was going to build a cheap WordPress site for a friend of mine. And when he was asking about content, they advised him to set up a spreadsheet to prepare his content. Um, he was putting all the data from one catalog entry into one cell, um, which obviously wasn't going to be a lot of use when it got pulled out. Um, but even if he had started working out that he might need to put it in different cells, there's still going to be problems. Um, my suggestion was, or my question, is how quickly could you guys set up a Drupal site, um, look at that content, um, get that site somewhere online, uh, a 5 to $10 VPS, um, and basically allow someone to start adding their, adding their content straight into the site uh, without any thought about further col um, complications, etc. Already, if five, you do that... Five minutes. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, five minutes. What, about seven, maybe? Five on a good day? <laughs> so, yeah, it's extremely, extremely quick. In fact, you can probably... Some people would probably take longer to set up a spreadsheet um, to take that data. Um, instantly, having done that, that, that user, the, uh, the prospective client, um, on this, this, we're looking at a cheap site, remember, um, is creating content that we can search and sort. Um, it can be pre even previewed online, even if it hasn't been templated or structured yet. You get some, start getting some idea of how it fits together. You can um, start adding media, possibly, um, quite, um, quite simply you can show them how the taxonomies work and they can start fiddling around with their own categorization. It might not be the final version, but something's better than nothing. It's certainly better than a, a cell in a spreadsheet of just comma-separated words. Um, and next time they use that category, they've capitalized it or whatever. Um, and the client's starting to engage with stuff, um, et cetera, et cetera. And, and a radical idea, maybe even your design uh, UI, UX guys can already start looking at that um, the design guy might even get an idea about how um, he can design around the content that's starting to appear. Right, so that's a very quick thing we could do with Drupal. Um, so now let's start to look at adding PHP. Um, so obviously as a developer, <coughs> or site developer, some of it's Drupal developer, some of you guys raised your hands when I asked. Um, you've got all those admin tools. Um, but you've got the opportunity to write some PHP code, and you can put that PHP code somewhere. Um, Drupal provides hooks, etc. Um, I like to think of Drupal without custom code as a sort of ready meal. Um, so, um, on a scale of simple brochure site, um, well, that's a Rustler's microwave burger, um, all the way up to enterprise Drupal site with proper development. You just, that's you know, master chef professional, I guess. Um, so. Many Drupal sites really are this, um, so it's not cooking, uh, but it might be fit for purpose. Um, and this is, might seem an odd question at this point. Um, I was wondering why I put that slide exactly here, but never mind. Um, it does make sense later on. Um, clients, you often set up admins. Um, very rarely are they given the extra training that takes them to the level of site builder. Um, there's almost a massive resistance against that. 
um, that I've seen in agencies where if you look at some other frameworks, um, it's more likely that someone who's been given a WordPress site is going to then go on and learn a bit about how the, the, the actual proper configuration of that site works rather than just the bits that they've been given access to. Um, and I think their resistance is simply because we're afraid that the cards will realise there's hardly any custom code at many sites. Um, would anyone disagree with that? You would disagree. Yeah. In many yeah. sites or many of your sites? In most cases, we would give uh, people that training because that's not their job. Their job is to write content, deal with content, or whatever, but not to. Okay, that's a valid point. I'll, I'll we'll, yeah. Okay. It's, it causes problems with features and stuff as well because mm. they need to be able to connect that. And yeah, no, those are, those are very valid points. Um, hopefully, I can address them later. Um, uh, actually, um, this is why I asked if there's any themes. Um, I think a lot of sites, it's not always the case, most of the actual code that gets written um, is CSS, HTML, and JS, uh, JavaScript. So we could really say it's the themes that are doing all the work. Um, okay, so let's start getting a little bit more um, developer -y. Um Does anybody, I uh, presume everybody uses or has heard of Drush? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just an extremely useful command line tool. Um, you can start doing slightly dodgy looking things with it, um, which, which is quite <coughs> useful sometimes. Like, so obviously I've got a Drush SQL dump, and I can just do a quick backup um, of my database, and I can load it back <coughs> in again. I'm not <coughs> recommending that as a developer thing, but if you're working on a local VM or something, and you just want to do a quick backup before you do something funky, that's a good way to do it. But you could, of course, script that as well. But um, one thing a lot of people I've worked with don't seem to do, and I'm not quite sure why, um, may maybe we get a feel for how many people use it here. Um, the Drush um, SCR will then allow you to run a PHP file, and it will automatically bootstrap and Drupal for you. So it basically, you can write a PHP file on your command line. So that simple bit of code I've got at the bottom there um, will just do the normal node load. Um, so that would node the node ID of 100. And then print underscore r node is going to basically print it out. Um, you can print it as a file or anything, but you'll see your node there, um, you know, all that normal node structure stuff. Um, but you could do a lot more. Again, this isn't good code, it's quick and nasty, node load multiple. I probably shouldn't be using that, but it's nice sometimes because if you're doing something quick, it does actually load the entire node. So you can load a bunch of nodes, you can iterate over those nodes, you can do something evil to them, and then you can save those nodes. Um, so there are hardly any lines of Drupal, and that, that will work with all the taxonomy functions, or basically all the stuff that you can do in Drupal. Um, and very nicely Drush works with Drupal 8. I might have lied there, I haven't tried it for a while, but uh, when I did try it last, you can do that sort of stuff with Drupal 8 stuff as well. So if you load things, some of the static <coughs> stuff, you can do some of the service container stuff and bits and pieces and just tiny little snippets of code, um, which is quite a nice way to start mucking about with bits and pieces of Drupal 8 you get. Um, Drupal 8 is going to be even better. Um, it uses Composer, and I believe that PHP back package manager will now work to manage libraries and your modules, etc. So that's another good reason to be getting onto the command line. Um, and there's a Drupal 8 console um, that's been written by a guy who I forget the name of, but I've stuck a link in there. If you search for Drupal 8's console, you'll find it. Um, it's absolutely amazing. Um, you, you basically, it will create all that nasty boilerplate code you've seen um, that's probably makes most people scared of Drupal 8. Um, it will create all that for you, for modules, for services, for routers, it will, you know, routing um, sort of paths. It will basically just ask you a few questions and, and off you go. If you want to create a plugin or block in Drupal 8, um, it will put that code in the module in all the right place with all the right stubs and everything just ready for you to actually start writing functionality, um, which is pretty good. Um, so usually when I say something like, um, oh, we could just write a quick script to fix these nodes or something, someone will say, oh, we, should, we could use, use bulk operations. Um, I guess most people know how that works. 
it's just a way that you can actually get things in views so that you can just like take loads of bits or just change loads of fields, that type of stuff. Uh, and that is a very good option, uh, especially for people that don't code. Um, but in the, if you're writing in a script, you can get a render page or a path uh, with a little helper code somewhere else. You can even override hook implementations if you want to run a special bit of, uh, a bit of cookery um, using hook module implement alter. Um, or just send about anything you can think of. Um, now, I, I would say if you're a developer and you haven't used it before and nothing springs to mind at this point, then you have no soul <laughs> because there's got to be something it's useful for. Um, but, okay, let's sweeten Dill a little bit. Um, has anyone used Query Path library at all? A couple of nods. I guess not too many people. Um, well, Query Path is um, a PHP library that um, basically allows you to load in um, HTML um, or XML and gives you full access to the document ob object model. So it's a basically, if you use jQuery, everything you can do in jQuery, um, you can access the same things, not quite the same syntax, and do the same sort of monkery around actually in the Drupal code. Um, and one of the most evil things on the planet, of course, is the WYSIWYG editor. So I've got a picture of one there. Um, it's very powerful. Uh, a little bit of code there. I think all that's doing is just removing the um, images. Um, and then you could write the, the body back again, no body. Um, but that's a fairly trivial sort of thing. You could use it to remove empty strong tags, empty, um, you know, that have been put in by WYSIWYGs. Um, and basically fix just about anything. Um, and you know, you can't really do that with fuse bulk operations. Um, so really, content management framework isn't gonna be any good if you can't get stuff in and out. Um, start with a quick and dirty. Uh, probably the easiest way to get stuff out, um, one of the most glamorous way, um, is to use the universal solvent of data, which is the CSV file. Um, uh, you, you could make a script to do that, or alternatively, there's a Views Data Exporter module. Um, if you install that, you just get a nice little, uh, you do a bit of configuration, but basically, whatever view you can imagine, you get a nice little button, and you can download a CSV file of all the content from that view. So if, you, if you're a developer and you can do things with CSV files, it's a starting point. So now I'm another case study. Now you've got to bear in mind with all of these, um, this is not as an environment where there's a lot of time. Um, it's, it's, I've been doing fixing problems extremely quickly for them uh, because there's been a long history of problems that have built up. So in this case study, um, there was a large library of XML documents um, which originally were used for sort of like offline, uh, for pub, uh, sort of printing. Um, they came from sort of in, InDesign workflow, InDesign to PDF. Um, over the last six years or so, some of these documents have been XSL transformed into ancient um, Drupal 6 sites. Ancient, well, five or six years. Um, but there was no, those weren't tagged in any way. So by the time I arrived, they were hiding within thousands of other articles. And um, in theory, they had to update them. But to do that, they had a spreadsheet that told them where they were in the site. So they'd refer to the spreadsheet and then go and find it in the site. Um, but there was no, really there was no way, or, or as you can imagine, that got out of sync. Um, there was no way really to do a proper match because they even changed the titles when they stuck them onto the, uh, uh, onto the Drupal site. Um, so I could add a new field that would give the ID of the original document, which is obviously, as I mentioned here, what should have been done before. I also just say my favorite thing, spreadsheets are not databases. Um, if they'd added IDs originally when the stuff went in, I wouldn't have had this problem. Um, so it's not really too painful. I'd already created a simple um, production system that had loaded all that XML content into something nice and clean. Um, so I just exported some CSV files from that. Um, and then we wrote a script using the Drush approach uh, that iterated over those files. Um, and we started having a best guess um, about you know sort of what we could find by scripting, 
Um, and basically it was just one of those classic command line, fiddle repeat, fiddle repeat, work some, do some more guessing. Um, and very quickly, um, oh, also a very interesting PHP function I didn't know about before, similar text. It takes two bits of text and then gives you a percentage of similarity based on them. So we were cutting little chunks of paragraphs out and running that and tweaking the percentages um, on some test data until we got a good match. Um, it's hard to say exactly how long that took, but it didn't take too long. Um, we're not talking days and days, we're talking perhaps about a day in total to get those, those matches. Um, and in doing that, I could put the IDs into the Drupal 6 site. This hasn't scaled very well either. I was just trying to ex sort of sort of show that even on the production site now, I could suck that information back in. So if this was just a couple of rows, and again, I've had to hide some of this, a rows of view, uh, in a view on the main production system, um, I've got my content in there, but I've also now got the categories um, and the sites that it appears in. So I've also got that, suck that data back into the production system. So we've gone from a rough old spreadsheet to um, a fully categorized, taxonomized Drupal site. Um, and in the process, we've found, um, you know, crafty old bits of content that shouldn't be there, duplicate stuff, things that needed to be updated, and all that's been sorted, um, and people have, um, you know, gone in and fixed those. Right, so let's move away from the use cases um, and RSS. Um, RSS is probably the simplest, it's long in the tooth, but it's the simplest way of syndicating content, I'd say. It's not fit for purpose in many respects, but if all you're after is a title, description, and content type stuff, then RSS is, is good enough to actually start sending content to people. Um, uh, we actually had clients that needed to get some of this content that we were starting to put into this production system out. Um, and the best way, we, you know, we could straight away start building RSS feeds in Drupal, give those to their developers, and off we went. Um, there's, a, so there's a views RSS module, which gives you a bit more stuff. And this hasn't scaled, dull, oh, never mind. Um, what views, are, views RSS will do um, is it allows you to actually pick a sort of field level RSS feed. So you can take your RSS feed and you can bump it up um, so that you can actually pick exactly what fields from your content go in the different RSS elements. Um, and if, for example, there I've picked a body field, then down in the normal view stuff where I do body, I can override body and I can use the tokens from other fields to, so I can take two or three fields and glom them together in a sort of uh, whatever's useful. So actually, I'm running a bit short of time here. So I've got a case study here, which is replacing an ancient news um, editorial workflow. Um, I just want to run through this one quickly because it's kind of typical. It's building up from what I had before. Um, so they had a news content type. Uh, and they had a workflow that basically worked on emails, um, it worked on Word documents, Word documents um, sort of being um, going from Max to, um, to Word causing problems, then it was hand edited, um, it was proofread, it was put into six different um, Drupal websites um, and then RSS feeds were generated from it by them hand putting them into a WordPress site that they'd set up. So I built a news production system for them. So we put a news content type in there, in the, in the same production system I had before. Um, and we used the workbench module. So now all those different roles, proofer, et cetera, um, could go in and do their various bits and pieces. Um, I quickly found out there were some fiddly bits. Um, some of the sites needed some extra content. So I just added another field in the production, created another RSS feed. So I ended up with four or five different RSS feeds and each one provided the stuff that was needed by each of the individual little sites or clients. Um, and the hardest pr thing probably in that whole process, which as you can imagine, it doesn't sound hard, does it? It wasn't difficult, but it made a huge difference to them. The hardest thing was resistance from people. People don't like change. Um, but by chasing it up the system, we started with the guy who was working in the office we went back to the editor, and then we went back to the original freelance news writer. Eventually, 
and quite quickly they were all putting their content directly into the production system into a Drupal website where it was going through a workflow process. Um, I can't show you any news and this hasn't scaled again but this is the, like the workbench um, for um, the, the workbench module so <coughs> someone logs in depending on their role they can see what they've got to do they can see their drafts, they can see their, you know, what needs reviewing, etc. So, I mean, Drupal has just a bewildering number of other stuff. Um, I mean, you saw that's what it would look like if it was a real Swiss Army knife. I don't think anyone would disagree with that. I'm just going to mention a few very quickly. This is these are getting more out of the. Swiss Army knife and more into the socket set proper toolkit. Um, but migrate module, do people use that at all? Yeah. Um, it's, um, it's a much, it, it's a very, very, very uh, flexible way of migrating content into Drupal um, or between Drupals. Um, uh, basically, it looks a little bit scary at first because it kind of starts off in examples. You have to make objects. Um, and you know, start doing some object oriented PHP, but it's not that scary. And I would say it's a good way of, if you haven't done ob object oriented PHP before to actually start getting into it. Um, and there's various migrate um, modules that work with it. Drupal to Drupal's a really good one. Um, it is the way of getting Drupal 6 content into a Drupal 7 site um, or Drupal 7 <coughs> into a Drupal 7. Isn't cool. So, eight in cool. Yeah, in fact, they built on it to get the Drupal 6 to Drupal 8 stuff that they're currently working on. And Drupal 7 to Drupal 8. Oh, right, it's that. No, great part, it's just my yeah. Way, right? Yeah. yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. I, I think gone. Drupal 7 is a bit behind, though, isn't it? Yeah. I believe. Um, and REST. So, we're starting to get a bit more fasist, um, sophisticated now because we, we're looking at RSS. Um, we looked at RSS. That's pretty basic. Um, the REST uh, RESTful web service module. Um, that, um, without going into too much detail, exposes Drupal resources, um, entities <coughs> as RESTful web services, which means you can perform, um, create, read, update, delete type stuff um, just via yeah, calling URLs. Um, you can get stuff, we were getting it back in JSON, I think it does XML as well, um, I'm pretty sure. Um, that is actually in, that's the pledge from the module. Um, basically, it's going to be obsolete uh, with Drupal 8 because it's actually in core. So that's the thing uh, when you see stuff when they're saying, oh, look, you can do this with Drupal 8 and you know, get JSON back or something and, uh, and then fire it into AngularJS or something. That, that's effectively what they're doing. So they're building a, it's there's, there's kind of a mini API in there already. Um, the unique ID module, um, this is getting more sophisticated. Um, it develops, uh, generates a universally unique identifier for all the Drupal entities. Um, long strings look like that. Um, it does it automatically. Um, if you've got a central uh, publication system, then obviously that's, that's great because you can't rely on a node ID um, because that might be the same across different Drupal sites. Um, so you know, this, this is how you get those onto your, onto your nodes. Um, and even better, I didn't realize until recently, it does um, the same for versions as well. So each node that you load will have a unique ID um, and a new unique version ID. So that's a great way of checking whether something's been updated, perhaps a bit better than using the updated date. Um, text formats and filters, um, they just add more to the mix. So uh, extremely powerful, those things that you see, full HTML, filtered HTML, plain text, um, people often don't fiddle with those much, um, but actually there's a, there's a lot of power behind them. Um, there's a module called HTML Purifier, um, which adds a filter. Um, we created our own format called Migrate, um, so we can invoke it uh, per programmatically. And when you're using the um, Migrate module, you can cut in and just use like a function like check markup, um, which just takes the text that you're looking at you give it the name of the um, uh, filter, thank you. Give it the name of the filter you want to filter against, and it will do that for you. Um, I mean, so you could have given it, you know, sort of like uh, full HTML or filtered HTML, and it will, it will sort that out for you, which is quite nice. Um, so another quick use case. Um, 
So this is repurposing existing content for redistribution or resale. Some of the other content that wasn't XML derived in this Drupal site, um, they wanted to um, basically take it out, um, tart it up a little bit, um, and resell it. The trouble is they were kind of pearls that were sitting amongst a, a, another vast quantity of, of content that they weren't interested in. And giving content to other people is hard because you can't just give them a bit of crafty old HTML that came out of a WYSIWYG five years ago um, and expect them to drop it into their site. Um, even more so if you've got presentational stuff on there because they don't want your classes or IDs um, in the HTML that they're trying to put into their web page. Uh, so we could take an iterative approach, we um, used Migrate module, we migrated the Drupal 6 sites into a Drupal installation um, and then we used the query path module I was discussing earlier to do all the fixing and fiddling. Uh, it takes a little while, um, it's a similar process to if you were trying to rejig an HTML page with jQuery, <laughs> um, which people used to do, it's probably not good practice now. Uh, but after progressive iterations, triage, etc., um, we managed to clean that up quite nicely. So we ended up with a collection of cleaned, categorised content in the production system that could be repurposed, and it was the content that they wanted. And again, we're talking about days rather than weeks or months, um, which you know might seem to be the problem when you looked at the original data they had. Um, code quality. Just a quick comment on this. Um, parts of this may seem a little casual and relaxed based on some of the coding standards and other bits and pieces and, and approaches that people are taking. Um, but all of that can still be used um, and I don't think there's anything wrong in taking an iterative approach. Um, scripts that bootstrap Drupal can be well written and tested. They can contain functions that could then be removed if you want to reuse them into a helper functions in a module. Or you can move them into a drush, um, using the drush hook in a module. Um, you can move them into drush commands. So it's kind of an iterative process. Um, and you do need to still do so some things to defend against chaos. Git, like Chet said this morning, is the universal um, get out jail free card. <laughs> Um, you need to know what you're doing with taking backups um, and you can use obviously modules like features um, you can name field sensibly reuse them across content types where possible um, and have a flexible development process so um, virtual machines lightweight VPS's um, are good for experimentation um, regardless of the final product environment you can have a pyramid that goes all the way up to your completely, you know, sort of locked down production server. Um, I've had sites that have had half of the content types featured, featureized, and some of them not because stuff's still going on. And then once that gets finalised, they all get featureized. Um, there's, no, there's no problem with doing that. But um, I'm firing up Drupal sites all the time, virtual machine for each product I'm working on. Um, we, when there was two of us working on our production system, so many things were going on. We even created mini install profiles so that we could load the production system with only the bits we were interested in. So we could load the news production system, we could load the um, XML content production system um, and load all that into a virtual machine um, using Vagrant and, uh, and off we went. Um, and pragmatism is important. Um, testing is good, rejecting anything, everything that doesn't have tests is bad. Um, simple test in Drupal is, is I think limited in usefulness. I can see why it's useful in course and modules. Um, I don't find a lot of people using it in day-to-day -day development, at least not on low-level sites, because it's quite heavy going. I, I would use Selenium in a browser, or something that other people could work with easier. Um, Drupal 8 does support PHP unit. I haven't tried it. Um, what, what does kind of annoy me a little bit, because the guys I was working with suffered from this when they tried working with other agencies, is sometimes I've seen serious obstacles to project or work completion because of blind people blindly adhering to um, methodologies. Um, you have to look at each case as it comes. I mean, the, you know, the important thing is, you know, working software. If somebody really needs it tomorrow, then you do what they need to get it tomorrow. Doesn't mean you can't document it and say what you need to do to make it a proper process. 
Um, but you know, I've seen people that wouldn't be, they weren't prepared to do that basically, um, and that caused them a lot of problems. Um, and that makes me feel like that, basically. <laughs> because these people, they were actually getting charged a lot of money uh, where, where they, they didn't need to be um, by the agencies that they were working with, um, especially in the situation they were in at the time. Um, I'm not really that bad, though. Um, right, how am I doing for time? Got one minute to... <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. You're holding people back from beer. So I'm holding people back from beer. All right, I'm going to quickly whiz through this then. Um, use Drupal, use case. Drupal for content only. It's so strong for content, I think basically there's, use, there's a use case for using it as a content only back end um, and feeding a separate front end. Um, that's not new, headless Drupal, people using AngularJS, et cetera. Uh, but I'm kind of proposing even to the extent that Drupal could be feeding into another CMS, um, a lightweight one if the front end was, I can't see any reason, especially if the client's already got a WordPress site or whatever, um, but they've got more complicated content requirements of starting with the content and feeding that into a lightweight CSS, CMS. Um, that won't go down too well. So what about Drupal behind Drupals? <laughs> um, so in other words, a heavy duty workflow content management system feeding a very lightweight front end Drupal site. Um, and you get some advantages from that. Um, the content on the front end can be simpler. It doesn't need all the metadata. It might not even re need revisions etc. Um, administration and roles on the front end system, much simpler again. Storage requirements on the front end, simpler. Performance on the front should be better. Both systems will be carrying considerably less modules. Um, security on the back end could be much, much tighter. You can stick it behind um, other types of authentication, for example, because regular users aren't using it. Now, imagine if you, your site had been hit by Drupal again, and your front end lightweight site had been hosed, but all your content and site generating site was nice and safe because you could tick the boxes that said it was this, 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 and normal people couldn't even access the login. Um, then you'd be laughing because you just have to regenerate the front end site. Um, and of course, if you're working like that, themers can often be working on the front end um, without any back enders getting in the way for a large proportion of the time. Um, you may even be able to produce a static front end site from your production system or sites. Uh, Larry Garfield talk there, he's doing something very similar, Drupal decoupled with Silex. That's a talk worth having a look at, it's um, in the Amsterdam um, Drupal Club Amsterdam. Um, things I haven't addressed yet, because I haven't had to, I'm confident I can. Um, multilingual, if I have to, I haven't done multilingual in this type of approach. Um, and I haven't done um, push notifications because performance hasn't required it yet. So generally, my sites are asking for updates uh, and then putting down the content that they want. Um, I can see at some point performance would, you know, you, you'd need the production system to actually tell um, the um, satellite sites uh, what they needed. Um, final pause for reflect. We don't really need to reflect, I think. Um, I just did. So um, we are carrying on with the process. We're completing a project to make highly customized Drupal 7 sites that can put in all these different types of content. Um, we're using um, Drupal to Drupal now. Um, and the front end is the only thing that's delaying us a little bit because it's that pesky 10% in my opinion. Uh, I'm a lot happier with Drupal than I used to be. Um, and I still say agility is about the things that work as near as possible to when they are most needed. Anybody got an easy question? <laughs> yeah, when the client gave me a CSV file, I looked at my grades and I thought, what does this do that feeds module doesn't do? Oh, I see, yeah. Um, I didn't mention feeds on there, but yes. Um, uh, Trying to put it in a nutshell. Help me out, Ollie. Um, I'm, 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 my great's beefier. My great used to spend weeks modeling and crappy shitty CRM data and stuff. But at least with my great, it's permanent because you've got the encode and classes where it feeds through the UI. That's um, a good answer. And also, you can get in, at some point, you get through the feeds and you want to do something, but you just can't do it and you wish you could do it in my great. You can roll back the floor of my great. And you can roll back the floor of my great. 
you can batch stuff up and you can also have intelligence on when you're moving. You know, if it's not a direct link, you can say, well, if it's that, do that. I, I like it when the audience likes <laughs> 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 You can have permanent migrations as well, so if you obviously have like, a legacy system where you can just set up a migrating script so it'll do it every week or whatever, then that's what you're doing. Yeah. Um, I, I, so, so everything they said. <laughs> Anybody else with a question? Have you used the deploy module? Uh, no, I haven't. Just someone was chatting about it. Yeah, I touched it. But someone was chatting about it yesterday for deploying content from one side to another. Yeah, I don't, I've seen it. You can use it to like generate content automatically and then install profile and things. Like I've never actually used it. It, it, but again, it's just another example of something that's probably worth looking at. I guess the main thing is to avoid the clash of the two sides. Yeah, so I can't take a look at that. You, you, I do do that. Thank you for listening, everybody. Thank you.